problems <laughs> at the plate. She took advantage of all the outdoor activities in the Northwest. Here she is at the top of one of our Cascade Mountains skiing on a sunny day. She was also, or is also, an accomplished water skier. Now, occasionally, Amanda pauses in her activities. And here she's shown cooking. But even when she pauses, she's always producing something outstanding. Those loaves of bread look pretty delicious. Now, after spending time in the Northwest, she migrated south to Dominican University in San Rafael, California. The school mascot is the penguin, the mighty penguin. And as the mighty penguin, she was a very, very accomplished student and athlete. She won the senior award for outstanding biology student, outstanding student in chemistry. And finally, they got tired of it all, and they named her the outstanding student in science, period. <laughs> In addition to this, she was an accomplished softball player. She started on her varsity team, and she was the most inspirational player. And as a senior, she was named All-Conference and Player of the Year. And here you see her receiving her award as the Conference Player of the Year. You'll also see one of the penguins bowing in deference to her. <laughs> now, after spending time down in California, the letter W became important. To her. She came back to the state of Washington, where she matriculated at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She was an outstanding student and graduated with honors. Then we had the good fortune of having her join our residency, where she earned, as one of only two recipients, three years in a row, the Student Award for Excellence in Teaching. So only two residents have been chosen for this award all three years. Uh, I was very joyful when she agreed to be chief medical resident here, and she's been outstanding as a teacher, she's been outstanding as a leader, and she's also done excellent research, which she's going to present today. When I learned that she was going to be one of my two chief medical residents, I was tempted to do a cartwheel, and I, better judgment prevailed. <laughs> now, Amanda, however, and the second reason why the letter W became important was that uh, the love of her life is Will, and she met him up here in the state of Washington. And here's a picture of Amanda jumping for joy in Paris on a trip with Will. When Amanda got married, uh, she did do a cartwheel in her wedding dress. <laughs> I'm told that is not Will in the background. <laughs> so I'd like you to pause and give a nice warm round of applause to Amanda K. Shepard, who is emblematic of excellence in motion. All right, thank you. That was incredible. Um, and I will remain on my feet, hopefully, for the rest of this. So um, I may be doing cartwheels afterwards in the hall. You can catch me there for our calisthenic workout. So as part of Chief Resident at the UW, we get the opportunity of doing six months of dedicated research time during our not-so-active chiefhood. And um, during this time, I work on a project with Dr. Levy looking at heart failure transplants and outcomes. Um, and so that's where this is coming from. But it actually starts a little bit before that. It starts as my uh, rotation on Cardiology B here as a second-year resident started with this gentleman. So this is a case of a 59-year-old man with history of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy who was admitted to the cardiology B service, again, for an acute on chronic systolic heart failure exacerbation. He was last admitted two months prior, and when we talked to him, his frequency of admissions is increasing over the last number of years. He was admitted only uh -oh, twice uh, a couple of years prior, and then within the last month, a number of times in the interim. He's admitted with his usual symptoms of dyspnea on exertion, proxismal nocturnal dyspnea, lower extremity swelling, and general fatigue. And at the point of time on admission, he had to stop a number of times before being able to make it to cardiology clinic uh, for these symptoms. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him while we fix what's going on. So his past medical history is notable for having class 3 heart failure at baseline. Um, with an EF of 33% with severe tricuspid uh, regurgitation. 
He has a history of proxismal atrial fibrillation and um, had an ensuing cardioembolic stroke a couple years prior. He also has chronic kidney disease with a history of a creatinine um, of about one and a half at baseline, but elevates every time we try to diurese this gentleman. Um, and then he also has a history of gout. So his medications, um, which would be showing up here eventually, um, are notable for a beta blocker, carvedilol, and torsamide, but he's been unable to tolerate ACE inhibitor due to acute on chronic renal insufficiency, as well as um, isosorbide and hydralazine for the same reasons. I'm getting there. Sorry. No, it's okay. Is that right there? Uh, one more. Yeah, that's all right. Awesome. Thanks. So in addition to round out his medical history, he's on allopurinol, quilchicine, and coumadin. Um, and these are really common for this patient and not surprising in any way. The fellow told me to go admit this patient in clinic, and I walk down, and I meet what is very obvious to me as an unapp uncomfortable appearing man. He looks like it took uh, all week to make it from um, the parking garage to clinic. His blood pressure is 95 over 60, and he's saturating 98% on room air, but notably his weight's increased two kilos since his last nurse visit just a week ago. This is perhaps the best cardiac exam I've done in my entire residency, um, but he had a regular rhythm at the time, but a prominent S3. His JVP was elevated to about 15 centimeters of water, and he had faint crackles at his basis with a pulsatile and palpable liver below the costophrenic margin. His legs were swollen, um, but warm all the way with the exception of his toes. And so at this point, with his admission labs, which are not surprising to any of us with mild hyponatremia, an acute on chronic renal injury with a creatinine of 3.4, and a baseline anemia and thrombocytopenia, we do what we do on cardiology B, which is we admit, we diurese, and we start a cardiac transplant workup. And that was our plan, except on my way out the door after uh, explicitly talking about code status and contact numbers, he asked me, I know this isn't going in the right direction. And he points out his increasing frequency of admissions over the last couple of months. And he asked, but what are my options? And how long can I wait? And as an R2, I looked at him and I was like, uh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, let me figure that out. And so just as his history is helpful in predicting his future, I think it's fun and interesting to look at the history of heart failure and medical management as well as surgical management of this. And it's also just quite interesting. So if we start in the research era, this all begins with Dr. Alexis Carroll, who's a French surgeon. Dr. Carroll uh, performs experiments with vascular anastomosis. He first does vein to vein, artery to vein, artery to artery. And then about a decade later, actually removes a dog's kidney and transplants it into the neck, and the dog does just fine. Sixty years later, doctors Webb, Howard, and Neely at, at Ole Miss actually prescribe a method for orthotopic heart transplantation. Unfortunately, this method is quite meticulous, involving transection of each of the pulmonary veins and then reanastomosis of the donor organ. And their dogs didn't do as hot, um, surviving on average of hours. But Dr. Lower and Dr. Shumway, Shumway we'll be hearing a lot more about here in a moment, um, at Stanford use a rotating disc oxygenator, and they, instead of going through this meticulous reanastomosis of the pulmonary veins, actually go ahead and use a partial atrial preservation method, and their dogs live weeks. Meanwhile, just down the California coast at UCLA, Dr. Goodwin, who is working in transplant nephrology, uh, first introduces triple immune therapy with cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and prednisone with the intent to stop individual rejection episodes, which is, at this point have not been histologically identified, but we're seeing this improvement rapidly growing. That brings us to the early clinical era, perhaps the most interesting, in my opinion, and it all starts out with a chimpanzee. So in 1964, um, again at Ole Miss, Dr. Hardy performs the first chimpanzee to human heart transplant. This is the first human heart transplant done uh, with the donor, our distant cousin, the chimpanzee. Unfortunately, the donor heart was gravely undersized to be able to sustain cardiac output in the patient. And even though they were able to take the patient off cardiac bypass, uh, the patient died about 90 minutes later. Not to be outdone, the South African surgeon, Dr. Christian Bernard, performed the first human-human transplant. And this, in the era, was 
extremely successful. The patient lived 17 days, dying of pseudomonal pneumonia in the end. Um, but he got his face on the front of Time magazine. Unfortunately, his brother and first assist surgeon did not. Um, so that points out that you need to be close to your siblings. <laughs> so within the next three years, we've uh, performed about 150 transplants. But enthusiasm for heart transplantation is greatly falling as our mortality is very high. But Dr. Shumway's enthusiasm is not. He is looking at rejection as the primary cause of death in this early transplant phase. And he looks at a rejection detection and treatment algorithm and actually develops the right heart cath and biopsy as a mechanism to do this. And his survival is in incredibly improved, up to 43% at one year in 1971. All right, so that brings us to the modern clinical era. And even though we're calling this modern, cyclosporin was definitely invented before I was born, so I'm hesitant to say that. But it all starts out with better immunosuppression mechanisms. And so cyclosporin is introduced in 1978. Dr. Shumway jumps onto this bag bandwagon quite quickly, and two years later starts using it with, again, improved survival. So just to compare, in 1980, Dr. Shumway's five-year survival is about that as it was in 1970 at one year. So an incredible improvement. Between 1980 and 1988, we do almost 10,000 heart transplants. It's when the University of Washington does our first heart transplant in 1985. And by 1990, the rate of increase of transplantation drops off. And this isn't due to enthusiasm because it's working, but it's due to a limited donor supply. He's still looking at me. He's <laughs> like, how long can I wait? I, you know, that's great and all, but tell me about me. And we're actually pretty good at this. We can predict mortality and heart failure. And that's because we're here in Seattle and we've got the Seattle heart failure model. And for those of you who have never seen this, go to your nearest Google search engine and type in Seattle heart failure model, and you'll get something like this. You enter your patient's clinical, medical, and laboratory data, and it pops out what I needed at the bedside, which was, it's not so good. You have just more than a coin toss likelihood to live past the first year, and really, your survival is quite bleak. So this is the data that we can tell our transplant patient. But can we predict weightless mortality? So the Seattle heart failure model was built on all heart failure transplant patients and not the sickest of the sick, those on the wait list. Um, and we need a better mechanism to be able to decide who will and will not be able to survive. And the Seattle heart failure model actually can do that too. So here is the mortality on the um, y-axis over here. No. All right, on the y-axis is mortality. And on the X is weeks after listing for high urgency heart failure. And as you can see in purple, the patients at the highest risk, the Seattle Heart Failure Score 4, have also the highest risk of mortality on the wait list, indicating that, yes, the Seattle Heart Failure model can predict weightless mortality. And just one more thing to say is the sickest of the sick up here in Seattle Heart Failure Model 4, they have about a 25% likelihood of not making it after three months of heart transplant listing. This is a quite acute group. What about predicting mortality in heart transplant recipients? That's really what he's asking. He knows that he's not going to live much longer. And he knows that heart transplant is probably one of the best things for him, but it includes a big sternotomy, a long surgery, ICU time, and immunosuppressants. So what can we tell him about his likelihood of living through heart transplant? Can we predict his mortality? In a bigger picture, can we decide who's going to benefit most with heart transplant? And can we use these outcome predictions to better allocate the scarce resource of organs to those who will benefit most? And this takes you a step back to the UNOS data, which I'll talk to you in just a moment about. But as of today, there are 3,527 patients currently and actively listed for heart transplant. But during the year of 2012, only 2,214 2,449 donors became available, and even a smaller number actually went to transplant, this demonstrating the grave uh, imbalance between donors and recipients who need this scarce resource. So, you know, so I think it's important for us to know kind of who does this. 
UNOS is the United Network for Organ Sharing. They are the first and only group in the U.S. to do this. They're private nonprofit, and they manage the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network. In 1999, they developed what's kind of like the online UNOS, and they electronically link all hospitals and organ procurement organizations together. So your patient's listed for transplant here. They're put in a category. Donors are identified. Donors are matched. Um, and all of this data is kept. And it's great because we can analyze it, and re, uh, use it to look at mortality and wait list times, as well as subset analysis to be able to figure out who's going to benefit the most. So the, the point of UNOS is to break patients into classifications, but also to donate organs geographically. So we know that this cold ischemic time in donors is related to mortality post-transplant. So we want to be able to allocate our organs to those most nearby first. We then have to match body size and ABO type. This is more than just chimpanzee and human, but as you know, we need um, good immuno match. We then allocate it to the sickest first, and then those ranked by wait time. And so UNOS describes sickest based on candidate status. And so status 1A, these are the sickest of the sick, the ones that you're all getting paged about a whole bunch because we're worried about them and we're quite worried. They're on dual inotropes, they are requiring invasive monitoring, or they need an intraortic balloon pump. Maybe they have an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device, but this LVAD is not the run of the mill doing fine, but this LVAD has um, a line infection or a thrombosis associated with the machine. And then notably, some LVAD patients undergo a 30 days of elective status 1A. And this is partly historic in that the early pulsatile models of VADs had an extremely high mortality. And so these patients were granted status 1A for a short period of time to kind of offset that mortality that they're seeing with the use of their ventricular device. Status 1B is still quite sick, but not that sick. These patients are requiring mechanical or inotrope support. And then status 2 is kind of everybody else. So in status 1B, you can be home. In status 2, you can definitely be home. Status 7 is the residents in the back there looking at liver transplant patients know oh so well. These are the temporarily unsuitable for transplant, either they're septic have some sort of ongoing malignant workup or whatever that might be. So again, to say this, the UNOS categories are in an effort to allocate organs to the sickest patients first. And this is a publication by Dr. Dardis, uh, right up there, pulmonary, or cardiology fellow, who demonstrates this quite nicely, demonstrating that in the red line, the status 1A patients have a significantly increased mortality over the 1B and the 2. And to say this in another way, the status 1A patients have an 80% likelihood of dying by their first year, whereas the status 2 patients have an 80% likelihood of surviving. So a great uh, discrepancy between these groups. However, and um, I'm not going to show you the data for this, but there is also a lot of discrepancy within these groups. Uh, all those patients in group 1A do not experience this same mortality risk. So he says to me, all right, well, I'm a status 2. But unfortunately, a week later, a patient decompensates, and he needs IV inotropes and a transfer to the unit and actually requires a balloon pump. But he's still looking at me, and he says, what's my post-transplant survival risk? Well, we know a lot about survival and transplant. And the first thing we know is it's good to be here at the University of Washington. Here at the UW, our institution has a high volume. Our surgeons are superb. And as you can see in the black line, the UNOS, or the general um, national data, does not perform quite as well as we do here at the UW. So first thing, Mr. Patient, it's a good thing you're here at the UW. We also know that transplant survival has improved over the following decade. The blue line is the 80s, the green 90s, and the red, the 2000 decade. And so transplant mortality has improved over time. And as you can see, it seems like the discrepancy of mortality is primarily in the first six months. And taking a closer look at that first five years, you can see that the mortality experienced in patients with transplant during the first one year is about one and a half times the mortality that they will experience in the following four years. So it's this one year time frame that is particular, particularly critical for our transplant patients. After a year six months, or perhaps one year survival, 
no matter what we've done in the last three decades, it really hasn't seemed to change a whole lot in that our patients are experiencing about a 3.4% mortality per year. This is linear and it's not been changing despite our improved medical management of her rejection as well as infection. And this brings me to morning report. So the causes of mortality in these patients vary based upon time post-transplant. And as you can see, graft failure in that early part is nearly half of all patients' uh, mortality. This is the stone heart that comes out of the, the OR on a number of inotropes, and they're never able to be weaned off. Acute rejection is certainly important during this period, and infection plays only a minority of causes for um, failure or for death during this time, most likely due to run-of-the-mill staph strep in that sort. The one-year mortality infection, this is what morning report is all about. This is mycobacterium to mucor. This is the fun, the wicked, and the, and the rare. Um, the graft failure at one year is not so much the stone heart, but at this point, vasculopathy is becoming an issue. This kind of not entirely fully understood chronic inflammation of the coronary arteries. Acute rejection is also a big worry from 30 days to one year. And perhaps the ebb and flow of Immune suppression related to infections and rejection is likely the cause for this. And then finally, we tip our hats to the primary care docs after one year who are able to screen our patients and look for early malignancy, as this is one of the biggest factors in long-term survival. <laughs> What's my risk? Gosh. Uh, yeah. Um, let me look at that. So. In the world of cardiology, it's all important to make an excellent acronym. So this is a good one. This is the IMPACT trial. We're going to make an IMPACT here. And this is Index for Mortality Prediction After Cardiac Transplantation. It was developed using the UNOS patient data that we talked about earlier. And after performing a risk score on a training and verification population, they developed a 50-point scoring system using 12 patient-specific variables. It's hard to be able to predict whether or not your donor will be male or female, ischemic or not. And so this is important to be able to provide our patients the most accurate data at their time prior to transplant. And the variables are shown here. And I'd like to point out that these variables are quite similar to those used in the Seattle Heart Failure Model, with the exception of heart failure etiology. The Seattle Heart Failure Model uses ischemic or not, but in the IMPACT trial, they actually gave an additional point for those with congenital cardiac disease. And they also used race, and here comes the use of LVAD. Um, an impact look at survival at one year, and those patients in the highest risk group, down here, 15 points, they experienced the most severe degree of mortality, nearing 50% at one year. Those patients in lower risk groups, the 0 to 2, 3 to 5, et cetera, those patients in incremental improvements based upon um, this data. So to say this in another way, the impact score is a way to determine who is likely to die within the first year. That's good. I can tell him something. But our patient's likely to need that because he has not yet been on the wait list. His symptoms are so incredible. But what about the utility of impact in predicting mortality in those patients using LVAD? And um, as you can see on the top, the p-value for statistical significance and the hazard ratios are appropriate, indicating that yes, you can with patients in LVAD, but that is not a typo. That's 0.5, not 0.05, so it's not able to predict mortality in patients with LVAD. So the Intermountain Risk Score is where we looked next. This is a new on the block risk score. It's an inexpensive and gender-specific score looking at common lab tests to predict mortality. It uses a CBC and a basic chemistry panel. That's it. It's great. Age, sex, CBC, basic chemistry panel. It was built and then validated on an in and outpatient uh, population, respectively, and then actually trialed on an NHANES population. And it's a good uh, predictor of mortality with an area under the curve of 0.85 at one year. Similar to how you Google Seattle Heart Failure Model, you can Google Intermountain Risk Score, and you get another put in your data and we'll pop out an answer. And that's what I did for our patient. And his score is 17. And so before I show you the next part, I want to make this incredibly clear. The risk score nomogram that I'm going to show you has not been validated in heart failure transplant, post-transplant, or otherwise. But just as an example of how this might work, 
This is the normal gram for the uh, Intermountain Risk Score. Our patient gets a score of 17 here. And this uh, corresponds to a risk of between 27 and 28 percent mortality at one year. So a group um, in Utah looked at the Intermountain Risk Score for predicting post-transplant mortality. They looked at all transplants performed in Utah between 2000 and 2010. It's protocol to get a CBC and chemistry panel at the time of admission prior to transplant. But unfortunately, there were only 53 women in the trial. But a good thing, there were only five events. Um, and so women were excluded due to a low event rate. This left us with 193 men for uh, evaluation. And here's their data. And this is a Kaplan-Meier curve again. We're going to get really good at looking at Kaplan-Meier curves. So um, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve with survival on the uh, y-axis and days post-transplant on the x. And this survival curve goes out to 10 years. And as you can see, the low-risk intermountain score population had a statistically significantly improved mortality at 10 years than those patients in the moderate or high-risk intermountain risk score. This is a small population. It doesn't include women. And the number of LVADs during this population was also uh, low. So this is where I start. Can we do any better? Our patient's still kind of looking at me, and I don't have a good answer for him. And so we attempted to replicate the utility of the Intermountain Risk Score in our population. We then looked at predicting survival based on Seattle heart failure models with the CHADS-2 and you know, the MELD scores and all sort, all these different scores it would be really nice to just have to know a couple. And further, can we predict outcomes in patients with bridge to transplant LVADs? And finally, can we devise a way to better allocate this source, this scarce resource to those patients who are most likely to benefit? And so the first thing I recognize as an early researcher in cardiology is that you really need to be able to make a good acronym. And so my co-chief and I, uh, a couple days ago on a sunny afternoon, sat at the whiteboard. And we looked at all these words, and we tried to figure it out. How can we do this? And so um, Sam and I came up with stop heart failure. It's pretty good. <laughs> I'm impressed. Now, this is not a prospective trial, and this is a bit tongue in cheek, but we had a lot of fun po pulling this up. So this is the study that Dr. Levy and I did this year. And this is a 240-patient retrospective analysis that that spanned 12 years. Uh, due to IRB regulations, we had to um, exclude patients less than 18 at the time of transplant. It was really only three patients, so uh, a benefit overall. We then extracted data on admission to calculate the Seattle Heart Failure Risk Score, or Seattle Heart Failure Model Score, as well as the Intermountain Risk Score. To tell you a little bit about the patients getting transplanted here at the university, they're men, by and large, 73%. Uh, 51 years of age. They're approximately 5'8", weigh 180 pounds, have an EF of 24%. They like to play linebacker, occasionally go for quarterback. Um, but their mean blood pressure is 82 and a third are ischemic. Comorbidities are incredibly common, with chronic kidney disease being the most common. Nearly half of our patients had chronic kidney disease. A quarter to a third had diabetes and a smaller proportion stroke and COPD. And our initial evaluation was to try to figure what sort of things predicted uh, mortality in this population. And so these are all of our patients. And as you can see, age, sex, NYHA class, and ejection fraction are unable to predict mortality. Ischemic cardiomyopathy is. This is nothing new. We've known this for quite some time. But it's nice to show that that's still the case. COPD seems to be a risk factor, though I admit openly that the number of patients with COPD in this trial are very small. And then not being able to use digoxin, and perhaps this is related to a provider's concern or history of toxicity with the medication. This is similar to the slide you saw at the beginning, but this is the data from the last 12 years. This is our heart transplant survival. The likelihood of living uh, a year is greater than 90% or so. And notably, our 50% mortality is off this graph, so if I can kind of eyeball it, it's probably somewhere about 15 years. We then looked at the use of LVAD, which is LVAD increased your mortality. It's oftentimes a repeat sternotomy. These patients have drive lines or chronic indwelling line, thrombosis risk, et cetera. And while the lines look really good, the p-value doesn't. So 
sorry. We don't have any evidence that LVAD actually increases your mortality. But what about the Intermountain Risk Score? And it does. This is the best part. The Intermountain Risk Score does predict five-year mortality in those patients undergoing transplant based on data um, received prior to transplant. And here is their Kaplan-Meier curve. The blue patients are the lowest risk, the green moderate, and the tan the high risk patient. And so with statistical significance, the Intermountain Risk Score is able to predict mortality after transplant up to five years. Notably, the lines seem to diverge quite early. And part of the Intermountain Risk Score is lymphocyte count. And so I suspect that, that may be a big driver of this, though I'm not exactly sure that we have a mechanism to prove that. No matter how many times we try, no matter how many times we cut the pie, the Seattle heart failure model just wasn't able to predict post-transplant mortality. <sighs> Darn. Uh, we tried. But it brought us to this, which is also impressive and also really encouraging. And so you have five-year survival on the y-axis. And patients are divided into their Seattle heart failure model scores on the X with zero being the lowest likelihood to die within five years. And four, you don't even see a blue line. This is the most pessimistic job uh, here in Seattle Heart Failure 4. But if you get a transplant, you are just as likely to live as the person with the uh, lowest Seattle Heart Failure risk score. Or to say that again, with transplant, everybody has about the same post-operative risk. So this is great. If we can get them there, they can do better. And I've got good news. The good news is heart transplant works. So this is the Seattle Heart Failure Model predicted mortality in the blue line. This is looking at their scores and then graphing what we would expect a patient to do with just medical therapy. And then in the red line is their observed mortality based on the data that we've extracted. And so as you can see, the five-year hazard ratio for transplant is 0.17. Or to say that in a different way, it has a reduction of mortality in, of 83% at five years. Our Philly transplant works. Good. All right. Let's keep doing it. We then looked at LVAD patients, and this is the same deal. LVAD uh, mortality expected with Seattle heart failure model versus observed with transplantation. And a bit of a caveat is that uh, the Seattle heart failure model has not been shown to, or has not been proven to be adequate at... Um, predicting mortality in LVAD patients. So when comparing what we predicted to other institutions' experience with LVAD, this is actually quite similar. So that's the caveat there. But LVAD has a risk reduction or a hazard ratio of 21% and a mortality reduction of 79% um, at five years. Now this big blip early is not surprising. This is a high risk OR procedure, a repeat sternotomy, as we've said again, driveline infections, et cetera. So I'm not surprised that LVAD patients are experiencing an increased mortality early on. We then looked at patients requiring inotrope support. These are the sickest of the sick in the Seattle heart failure model. They only have a 9% likelihood of living to five years. But with transplant, they're still doing quite well. They're up there at 85% with a risk reduction or with a hazard ratio of 0.07 and a reduction of mortality of 93%. So perhaps this is the group who is most in dire need of transplanted organs. Patients without inotropes do quite well as well. They're on 44% uh, survival at five years on basic medical therapy. I don't mean basic. I mean good Seattle heart failure medical mm -hmm. therapy. Um, but with transplant, they also have a hazard ratio of 0.21 and an overall mortality reduction of 79%. But taking this back a little bit, we talked about how LVAD patients are getting 30 days of 1A because of their high risk of mortality with what used to be pulsatile LVAD. But over the last decade or even more, with the continuous flow LVADs, those patients are experiencing an improved mortality. Um, and so we questioned whether or not it's just to have those patients still be classified 1A and 1B. And when we compare those patients in UNOS class 2 to those patients on LVADs, they're actually, and perhaps ironically, experiencing the same hazard ratio and the same improved mortality with transplant. So this would argue then that perhaps the use of LVAD um, status 1A and 1B um, is, not, is no longer applicable. So this is our stop heart failure uh, conclusion. The majority of patients transplanted here at the University of Washington 
a male. We know that risk factors for death are ischemic cardiomyopathy, but maybe even the COPD and not taking digoxin were statistically significant. I'm a little worried about the numbers overall for that. The Intermountain Risk Score can and does predict post-transplant risk in our population. And the Seattle Heart Failure Model, no matter how many times we tried, still wasn't able to predict post-transplant risk. And finally, and perhaps most provocative of all of this, is whether or not LVADs still deserve class 1A and 1B status and you know, based on their now observed mortality. So in conclusion, um, heart failure is rapidly advancing. We've moved from moving organs from abdomens to necks, from transplanting chimpanzee hearts, to now being able to improve someone's mortality to the mid-80s at five years of transplant. But this is all in the era of an unfortunate poor supply of donor organs, as we talked about early. Um, and transplantation is still the gold standard. You are still going to do best with transplantation. And so this is a, a problem that we will continue to face for quite some time. And then finally, the use of survival predictions and risk reduction analysis, in particular with those LVAD patients, may be a way in which we can help better allocate organs um, in the future. So I have a whole bunch of acknowledgments. So please sit tight for just a moment. The first is Dr. Levy. Um, he has helped me from printing out that IRB application to statistical analysis. And so it's been incredible. Thank you so much. Um, and the rest of his group, Dr. Mokadam, Shauna Andrews, um, and Ben Horn in the IMRH model. Dr. Bremner, thank you. Uh, what a supportive chair that we have here at the University of Washington, and he's been incredible on our journey. Dr. Anawalt has been our main leader, and he's led us through clinical teaching, uh, hospital administration, as well as a number of bike rides in the afternoon. So thank you. Ursula Bell, this lady knows everything. In fact, I, from here on forth, would like her known as Ursula Information Desk Bell, where she can help you find, know, or figure out any issue and any problem. Dr. Doug Pau has been an incredible mentor with our medical student teaching and helping us further navigate the sea of medical students. And then on the other side of the coin is the residency. Dr. Ken, Cor or Ken Corning. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry. Ah. <laughs> Now I got palpitations. That's good. All right. <laughs> Ken Steinberg and Kelly Corning <laughs> have really helped us through residency and have really made us so happy as residents here. And, and they run a tight ship, I've got to say. The residency office staff has always been quite supportive of the chief residents as well as the whole residency. I have to thank my co-chiefs. You've been lovely and wonderful. And in particular, Sam and Mayan, who are really kind of good cop and bad cop which left me with indecisive cop. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. That's all right. And then the greatest house staff in the known universe. You guys have really made this year so incredible. Thank you for playing my favorite game, Morning Report, every day with smiles and otherwise um, enthusiasm when I tell you about strep coming all the way from outer space. And then finally, my support outside the hospital. My husband is incredibly excited that this is over and he doesn't have to hear about heart <laughs> transplant anymore. <laughs> And then my mom and my dad. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Questions? That was a spectacular talk. Can you, can you tell us anything about the cost of this procedure and whether over the last 10 or 15 years that shows a trend? I know that the procedure in itself is incredibly costly. Uh, the transplant itself is hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I actually don't know how the cost is trending over time and how that compares to medical therapy either. Anybody? Thanks, Amanda. That was a wonderful job. Um, this may be a simple-minded question, but the digoxin thing, yeah. I, I sort of feel like 
Patients to whom I don't give digoxin often have lots of other things wrong with them, like renal insufficiency and various badnesses. Do you feel like the model adequately accounted for those? So this was just analysis of our uh, cohort, and we separated it into being able to be on digoxin or not. And I agree. I think it's most likely related to having maybe a high degree of black or otherwise um, renal insufficiency. Or things like that. I agree. Everyone sit tight. We have an awards presentation. What a pleasure it is to uh, be able to help uh, give out the uh, House Staff Awards as uh, nominated by the medical students, and especially on a day when Amanda has presented as one of only two of our uh, House staff who have won three awards, the other being uh, Dr. Andy Lux, who this year was retired as teacher superior in perpetuity from the medical students from the faculty side. So we know what your future lies, uh, Amanda. We know what's going to happen in the future with you, too. Um, in 2000, uh, we started having awards uh, for the house staff. Our house staff have been incredible teachers over the years and are, are such important uh, mentors and teachers of our medical students. And so we started an award that the students nominate. One of the key points of this award is to be eligible for it, a nomination has to come from a student. And the students will write wonderful stories about uh, how different house staff have have shaped their lives and have taught them. And so that's a key criteria is an actual student nomination. We have many, many house staff who are incredible teachers. They may not get a nomination. And there is some randomness in this. I mean, some students are better at actually nominating, you know, getting around to doing it. And sometimes, depending on the year, some, some of our house staff do not have as much time directly teaching third year medical students, which are the main group that, that do this nomination. So I want to just you know, before we start on the awards, thank our house staff for their incredible teaching and the high level. It is very, very difficult to limit the number of awards. And over the years, the awards have increased from four in our first year. I believe we have nine now. And, uh, and it's, you know, really, if we wanted to recognize all our house staff, we probably have something like, you know, 80 to 90 a year. And we have so many incredible house staff. So I will start by... Um, by announcing a, a few of our awardees, I'll, we'll start with our uh, awards uh, for those who are interns, and then I'll turn it over to Ken to um, to do some. Then I'll do one of the R2s, and then he'll do some of the R2s, and then I'll finish up. So we just, you know, this is the only way Ken and I can get exercise: is move back and forth. It, it works. So what we will do is read some of the comments uh, that came in on the nominating letter. Uh, so the first award is uh, to Jihan Budek. And let me read you the, the comments here. Jihan helped me uh, learn and work through the workup and management of patients I admitted with her. She was helpful in teaching physical exam maneuvers. Additionally, she was awesome to work with and always encouraging. She always makes time to teach. Despite having many intern responsibilities, she took it upon herself to keep an eye on students and ensure we had resources and tips to succeed as best we could. As an opportunity, at any opportunity, she would speak aloud and help her students understand her rationale or particular procedural step. Lastly, Jian's uh, congenial spirit made her such a pleasure to work with, and it was a true bright spot of my third year to be considered part of her team. Jihan. The uh, next award we'll be presenting to another intern is to Laura Bovey. And let me read you the comments here. Dr. Bovey was a truly inspiring physician 
to have as my mentor. Under her guidance, I learned so much about the best patient care as well as got a better sense of the medical knowledge needed to care for my patients. She was extremely compassionate towards all of her patients as well as patient, even, in this patient, even if this patient's meant spending longer hours in the hospital, often not, but not violating work hours, Ken, don't worry, um, but not, uh, often not going home to see her family until late at night. She is truly dedicated to teaching and went to great lengths to ensure I understood why she was caring for patients a certain way and never showed frustration or belittled me if I asked an in, insensible question. Her mannerisms and compassion with her patients is something I definitely want to emulate, and I hope to be as great of a physician one day as she is today. Laura. We are now uh, moving on to the uh, R2 class. I'm going to, the next word I'm going to present is to uh, Adam Jane Jensen. I really enjoyed working with Adam. I thought his greatest strength as a teacher was his balance in helping review and improve detailed patient plans while at the same time encouraging me to make decisions on my own. He's very calm and has a cheerful manner which made working with him such a pleasant experience. He was a natural team leader always providing encouragement and supporting my decisions while ensuring that patients receive the best care possible. He made this first month much more enjoyable than I ever expected. Adam. Okay. You can see we rehearsed this. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, R2s. Um, so at this next, um, it, we had a lot of comments for the next several set of residents, so I'm just going to read a small bit. Um, uh, but this resident um, is an enthusiastic educator. The environment she created fostered openness and pushed me to take greater responsibility for the patients I helped care for. Her educational sessions showed an enormous knowledge set, and she spurred curiosity and research from team members. She's an amazing teacher and always found time in between her hectic to-do list to prioritize small bits of efficient teaching. Her teaching was superior to the teaching provided by some attendings. <laughs> and she was always supportive and invested in our learning. Sarah Buck. Um, next resident, um, this resident um, is an enthusiastic, excellent team leader, a talented teacher, dedicated, hilarious. <laughs> He's an amazing senior resident. He was an amazing senior resident during my time at the VA. He's a talented teacher and is clearly interested in medical student education. He was extremely supportive of everyone on the team while still pushing us all to do our best. He made the environment fun and inspired excellence in all team members, Chris Murphy. This next resident was a calming source of encouragement and help through a tough internal medicine rotation. He helped me hone my clinical skills and taught me the skills necessary to succeed on all my inpatient rotations. He was a great teacher and really fun to work with, David Levin. Uh, 
this next president uh, did a great job as a team leader, always made time for teaching, um, managing a busy service, and was able to provide both great teaching as well as to ensure efficiency. She will be a great leader in her future career, and I hope to have the opportunity to work with her again. And the next comment, this resident was without a doubt the greatest senior I have ever worked with, Katie Benziger. Um, an R3, um, the last two are R3s. Um, this resident did a great job all around as a senior resident, a mentor, and an educator. Um, she was an excellent clinical role model in her interactions with patients, obvious dedication and empathy, even in difficult cases, very knowledgeable, easy to talk to and learn from, one of the best senior residents I've had all year. Not much left to improve. <laughs> <laughs> Anita Chang. Oh, taking care of me. Okay, great. And the uh, last word we'll be giving out is also to an R3 um, with uh, lots of comments. And this is for Margaret Chapman. Let me read some of these comments. Margaret was by far the best teacher I had on an internal medicine third year rotation. She was not only kind and compassionate to all of their patients, but she really took time to teach every member of the team, from the interns to the medical students, at our own levels. She gave consistent encouragement and was instrumental in helping me perfect my note writing, differential diagnosis, thought process, and especially my patient presentations. Where some of my residents would tell me that I was doing a good job and not give any other feedback, Margaret consistently gave me constructive criticism throughout our time together, striving to help me be the best that I could be without just settling for status quo. She is the teacher I hope to be one day in the future, and in my opinion, the best teacher out of all of the attendings and residents I have worked with. I'd like uh, for all of us to give a round of applause for all of our award winners and all our house staff who just are incredible teachers and, and really our students here are incredibly lucky because of the house staff we have here. Thank you all for uh, staying through this wonderful Grand Rounds today and uh, staying as we honor our, our wonderful house staff.